Thank you so much for being here. I'm not sure how to use the microphone, so let me know if I'm not using it correctly. Uh, thank you, Fanelomi, to inviting me to speak. And if you, um, as you've heard, uh, my primary research interests are in 19th century Russian literature. So the talk that I'm presenting to you today is pretty much a beginning of a new research interest. So it's a very, in a very preliminary stages, um, as you will hear, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, I'm sh um, I hope to bring things together. That's the point. Okay, so here you see on my slideshow two uh, lines of images. The upper one represents the official uh, policies of Kazakhstan, of Nusultan Nazarbayev, some state programs. Um, and the uh, line below is Anwar Dysinbinov, a poet from Astana. And I invite you to just contemplate for a second the difference in the uh, aesthetics. Right? Uh, how different these images are. And uh, pretty much my talk today will be about the difference between these two spheres, the official sphere uh, and this uh, sphere of unofficial uh, youth culture and poetry. I hope to bring them together. Okay? So uh, the capital of uh, Kazakhstan, Astana, may be too young to boast a rich literary tradition but it does not lack literature. This postmodern eclectic city of international business, bureaucracy, and futuristic architectural ensembles, a world of postmodernity and simulacra, is a site where new Kazakhstani identity is being forged in battles between the old and the new, the traditional and the progressive, the ideal and the material. As such, Astana possesses powerful symbolic potential. From the establishment of Astana as Kazakhstan's capital city in 1998, the state has exploited that potential in numerous national publicity and propaganda campaigns. A couple of them you see up there. Mangelik Yel, the eternal state, is the vision for the, what the country should look like in 2050. Um, uh, Ruhani I'm sorry, I don't know Kazakh, but I know what it means. Modernization of consciousness is a relatively new uh, program uh, that Nazarbayev came up with. Um, of course, the symbolic dimension of Astana exceeds its official mythology. The popular mythology of Astana becomes quickly known to any new inhabitant or visitor who comes to the city. From the different images that the two banks of the city have, the right bank, the site of the old city of Tselinagrad, and the left bank, the newly constructed Astana, two popular nicknames that cities, buildings, ensembles, and skyscrapers have. Between the official mythology and the popular one, a small and independent creative community has been producing meanings that remain largely hidden from the spotlight. Are acutely aware of both popular and official images of the city and engaging with them, they create their own Astana. It is that Astana, I would argue, that is more contemporary than its futuristic buildings, more creative than its recycled mythologies, its Biterex, and perhaps more consequential. Modern Kazakhstani poetry and Anwar Dysinbinov as one of its most talented representatives are actively engaged in exploring the city's symbolic dimensions, identity challenges that emerge from them, and modes of existence for a poet and an intellectual in post-Soviet Kazakhstan. Existing in the margins of official culture and deeply political in his seemingly apolitical and, uh, and mostly lyric poetry, Dusinbinov creates an Astana text that is both estranged from the city and intimately connected to it. Uh, the text of Astana needs to be analyzed, of course, in comparison with other city texts. I will briefly sketch one of perhaps obvious and useful parallels, although today I will not pursue it to the end. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm not actually quite sure what to do with it. Maybe you'll, you'll help me with it. But uh, to anyone familiar with the cultural mythology of Russia's old imperi imperial capital, St. Petersburg, symbolic parallels between Petersburg and Astana, its sister city since 1996, are obvious and striking. A city built in remote wasteland and marshes from the creative power of the Logos by the will of one strong ruler whose aim was to change the direction of the country by transferring the capital to a strategically important but inhospitable location. 
a city of order and of bureaucrats, a city of large architectural ensembles, straight, regular, and planned avenues, a city of infinite reflections, a city where a new westernized man is being born and where beards are cut. <laughs> a city whose main battle is with powerful elemental forces, a city of progress and a city of apocalyptic expectations, the end of which is professed to be a result of a defeated battle between the civilizing stone and the chaotic, cruel power of nature and weather. These are among key elements of the cultural and literary myth of St. Petersburg. They could equally describe Astana. What it means? Well, when I taught a Petersburg text of Russian literature to my Nazarbayev University students, one of them is sitting there from that class, <laughs> um, they reacted quite enthusiastically, uh, claiming uh, that Astana was in its Odic period, the first part of the Bronze Horseman, the Pushkin's text. The cultural production is limited to text that sing uh, praise to the city and to its founder. They speak uh, of uh, their glory. Official texts from the government decrees, um, uh, you know, official texts of Astana from government decrees to slogans on the city's billboards similarly uh, fall into the same aesthetic. This is what the students told me. And of course, this is not the same aesthetic. Uh, a repetition of this sort in history is famously called farce. In literature, though, it is called imitation. The cultural texts in this, in this light will be called secondary, unoriginal, hackney, tried. Astana then is just a simulacrum. Besides, this odic parallel is quite misleading. From what I can see, uh, the official Astana text is not aware of the parallels with the Petersburg text of the imperial period. It does not break with the past to propel the country to the future, as Petersburg did. The official Astana text is seemingly um, unaware or forgetful of its true literary and symbolic origins, the late Soviet aesthetics. The question of the degree to which the dynamic culture of post-Soviet Astana is rooted in the stagnant culture of the late Soviet Union needs to be further researched. Ultimately, it seems that the futuristic drive of Astana, on the other hand, uh, so it's not truly oriented to the future, at least a probable future, it is much more utopian, striving for the future that cannot exist. One can say uh, that uh, it is rather more oriented towards the past, towards a compulsive repetition of Soviet era grand projects, and is deeply rooted in the nostalgia for the late Soviet stability slash stagnation. Um, turning um, to the Astana texts of contemporary non-official Kazakhstani literature, and to the poetry of Anwar Dusinbinov, we can ask the same questions. So based on multiple similarities on the surface level, and I will show some of them, does Astana produce texts similar to Petersburg texts? How do these texts define Astana, its cultural and symbolic significance? To what degree these texts are original? Do they possess a similar quality as the official texts? Are they secondhand, tried, predictable? ultimately simulacra of real culture. And uh, I would like to argue that it is not the case. Dissinbinov's texts appear in the city, um, uh, so they, uh, so, so uh, sorry, Dissinbinov's texts are neither utopian, um, and they do not reflect cultural sensibilities of the Brezhnev era. Responding to the symbolic potential of Astana, Dusinbinov's poetry produces motifs and themes that might appear to, uh, similar to those of the Petersburg text. However, their meaning is distinct and original because they are neither futuristic nor are they struck in the uh, stuck in the past. Dusinbinov's Astana texts are deeply rooted both in the immediate present and in the eternal that for him is visible in that present uh, through the metaphysical and quite physical holes in that present. Um, I'm not sure how to switch slides, though. Maybe someone can show me because. I okay. Thank you. What did you do? I, I did it just by the button. And what should I do when I do the next one? This one. And you can push this. Okay. So, um, a few words about our poet first. 
um, a native of Taldekurgan. Dusin Binov uh, was born in 1985, uh, five, has been with Astana through its transformations. After graduating from the economics department of the Lev Kumilov Eurasian National University in Astana, he stayed in the city. Here he started writing poetry, a passion that he later developed uh, into a skill and conscious devotion after graduating from the poetry seminar at the Open Literary School of Almaty, a hub for contemporary Kazakhstani mm -hmm. literature. In the past 10 years, Dusinbinov developed a poetic, a powerful poetic voice, becoming not only a poet from Astana, or an Astana poet, but a poet of Astana. A status not in any way recognized, either officially or among the uh, general public. Dusinbinov is a phenomenon in a small creative community in Kazakhstan, and uh, a relatively well-known name in post-Soviet response creative community. Uh, thus, in the summer of 2016, Dusinbinov was selected for the prestigious residency program run by the organization Literature Without Borders, based in Riga, Latvia, one of the most important centers of contemporary Russophone literature. An important contemporary poet from the Arbita group, Sergei Timofeyev, from Riga, Latvia, who interviewed Dusinbinov in Riga, refers to him as, quote, a truly contemporary and free poetry, which is born in society of many taboos. And he calls Dusinbinov, quote, a powerful lyric voice, a verbal current that sweeps and carries in itself a multitude of all important and self-explaining details. So Dusinbinov is quite active in the um, unofficial cultural scene uh, in Astana and Dalmati. So for example, in uh, Astana, he organized poetry events called Post Poetry, which refers both to a world after poetry and to, uh, is a call for action as post poetry. For Dusinbinov's readers, poetry is an internet phenomenon Poetry is not published conventionally, but posted on Facebook, Vkontakte, read from mobile phones. Uh, so he's also interested in the performative potential of contemporary poetry and often combines poetry with techno music, creates short YouTube videos of his poetry and things like that. So he sees a need for poetry to be accessible and democratic. And recently he relocated to Almaty, so it's the end of his Astana. <laughs> uh, Astana period, time to make some sense of it. Um, yeah. okay. So, um, I wanted to speak a bit about the symbolic dimensions of Astana and the shape of Dusinbinov's Astana text. So I named a few features of the Petersburg text just for you to see how similar or different they are and what kind of meaning they produce. So elements and elemental forces play a crucial part in Dusinbinov's poetry. Um, his powerful li lyric current, uh, the powerful lyric current of his poetic voice is itself quite an elemental force. And quite often, one becomes a metaphor for another. Uh, his favorite place in Astana is on the embankment of the river Ishim. Uh, it's at the center of his in inspiration. This is a place where three most important natural symbols of his poetic world merge. The river and the stone, to, stone of the Ishim embankment, the wind and the sky. So uh, wind for him is a symbol of poetry, of poetic voice, of inspiration. It is cold in Astana, very cold, piercing, but uh, it is a pure, uh, uh, pure bare creative force. Sky, the sky and water for him are symbols of reflection, of eternity, and f of search for, a search for identity. Um, does it sound similar to Petersburg text? Uh, yes and no. So uh, everything here is on a bit different scale. In Astana there is more space. The skies are higher. The horizon is more prominent. The uh, cold and piercing wind brings not the civilization from the west, uh, not the wet air from the ocean, but the dry air of the eternal space, empty, remote, traditional, uncivilized, the steppe. The existential horror of Astana is not to be subsumed, by, uh, submerged underwater, but to be destroyed by the higher justice of the steppe that saw the rise and fall of many great empires that did not leave much behind. The steppe is infinite and empty, and uh, this, at the same time, it is the cornerstone of the Kazakh identity, the symbolic womb, 
the source of life and the end of life. So I'll uh, quote a bit from his um, poetry. Um, speaking in one of the interviews about Astana and the wind, um, Dissinbinov says the following. I love Astana. Here I experienced extremely important transformations. Its crazy wind that blows from all directions at the same time chiseled me, made holes in me. And now strange sounds pour out of these holes. I like to listen to them and sometimes to record them. So the following poem highlights the uh, meaning of the wind in Dusinbinov's poetic universe. So what I did, I put uh, some excerpts in Russian. I will read mine very quick and not poetic translations. So follow Russian if you can. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the one. Uh, firstly, poetry is the wind uh, for him, breath, breathing, and living. Okay? All the time I want to break the poetic line, or simply uh, on the very border of my breath. So for him, words of poetry are gusts of wind, strong and powerful, that slow you down, make you resist, make you walk against the wind, expose you, expose your lies, expose the lies of the city. The, uh, the wind brings out the city's true smells and its imperfections. The wind forecasts it, the city's future. So, yes, that's better. Now these are not words, but gusts of wind. Hating the hoods, it tears them down to look into your eyes so that when you walk, fooled by your eyes, uh, to throw in your face the sobering smell of sewage. Hating lies, it also breaks lead strips, tears the sails of posters, breaks off the fake luster, tile after tile, exposing the capital of the eternal tribe. If you've been to Astana, you, uh, you can picture what it looks like. Those tiles on sidewalks and on buildings are, um, are built to last five years maybe at most, so, uh, and uh, so when the, the, wind, the harsh wind blows, they fall one after another, exposing the guests the step, so in, and breaking the holes into uh, that city. Okay. Um, a few words about the sky. And Dissinbinov, again, in one of the interviews says, here we have not sky, but the skies. What other people refer to as emptiness, I call freely breathing eyes. It's when you seemingly walk in the city but you see the line of the horizon all the time. So Dusinbinov's connection to the sky is almost physiological. The sky and clouds often appear as extensions of his body as his breath. So look at this poem. Um, this is one from one of his most favorite, uh, famous poems, one of his best. There, this is just one line. Um, I smoke, inhale, the sky ex exhales the clouds. Um, so sky for him is the symbol of the internal, connected to uh, poetic inspiration and to the wind. Um, so uh, a few words about uh, water in Astana and the image of the river and Astana reflections. So reflections for Dusinbinov are connected with introspection, with a search for meaning, understanding, contact, companionship, love uh, and the reflection in another. So a few words from his poem, uh, August. Look how gracefully August unrolled with your palm letting out the door. Uh, look how uh, slowly the city pours over the river in reflection, reality finds a bit more truth. Um, remember this day for the first time, I do not lie when I pronounce thank you, do not lie when I pronounce I love you, do not lie when I proclaim I will love you beyond your person as echo, as revelation, as truth, as joy, as comprehension, as the depth, the distance that appeared now between myself and guilt, as liberation, nocturnal wind, the volume of the clouds, step stars, the sound of the highway, 
as music when you travel, as a taste of, of victory, as a glance to the door that silently closed forever beneath my shadow when I start walking towards the sun. So you can see um, in this uh, poem already uh, that uh, the elements that appear in Ducimbina's poetry are connected with not only um, poetic inspiration, reflections, they also ha are deeply um, sad. So there is a feeling of sadness, of alienation, of um, being sort of not the one with the city. However, uh, this sadness is not uh, pessimism, it's a sort of a happy sadness. It's a, had a sadness of a satisfaction of inhabiting a um, different world. So um, this is what Dysinbinov uh, says in one of his posts on Vkontakti site, which, uh, you know, his uh, open page Vkontakti is called Diktatsia. I'm not sure about you, but we live in a different, in a fairy tale-like and beautiful Astana, in a sad and impossible Astana, in Astana that is not um, beyond the limit of our vision. <coughs> so it seems that the sense that of abandonment, of loneliness, of this general sadness um, permeates this poetry. So they live in a different Astana, in a parallel world, not connected to the Astana as a capital, as a grand project of Nasultan Nazarbayev. In a sense, you, you would have a feeling that this is this poetic underground, similar to Soviet underground poetry, but it's, it is not quite that. Uh, and to understand how uh, Dusinbinov simultaneously lives in this uh, separate and um, seemingly alienated world, but is also is deeply political and engaged with the city, I'll go into a couple of um, themes. Okay, so a um, few words about this, uh, the spirit of Astana as Dysinbinov uh, understands it. As I said, he came to Astana when Astana was just being born and saw these grand projects from, the, um, from, from its own uh, start. Um, and uh, speaking about the spirit of Astana, Dysinbinov says that in spite of the pathos of the construction site, of that propaganda campaign slogan, Astana, my realized dream, in spite of severe winters, minus 40, minus 45 centigrade, uh, something here really uh, gripped me, and so he stayed. And uh, later he understood what it was. So he says, when I started, uh, so I understood later what it was when I started to write poetry. This is a place that seems to have holes in its energetic container. It breaks in tears here. This is where both dynamism and chaos come from. The ugliness and speed of architecture. The ugliness and speed with which bureaucracy entangled everything here. The ugliness and speed with which strange personalities, clowns, scandalists, and other celebrities appeared. You see, it can be ugliness or it can be goodness. Anything is possible here. But invariably, next to it, you would always put the speed. Energy, irrepressible, chaotic. It seems not to know its own shape. It erupts from the inside. So for him, Astana is both beautiful and ugly. Um, Dusinbinov senses in Astana a powerful dynamic, a creative impulse, which is about um, to create a new world from the tabula rasa, creating it anew and from the uh, fresh start. At the same time, Dusinbinov feels this uh, place as a post-apocalyptic space. Um, and um, similar to the tiles that fall one after another, Astana has this um, uh, tendency, uh, this potential to disappear and being engulfed by the step again. So maybe uh, this fascination with this uh, hole, these holes in the container, right, that uh, this is what attracts um, Dusinbinov to the city. But this is not just, um, Personal. It's not just about sadness. It's about uh, sensing what Astana is, and therefore here we're already beginning to get a bit political. So now uh, let's talk about um, his mode of engagement in the city and the sense of uh, both belonging and not belonging to it. Uh, Dusinbinov says that he is inscribed into Kazakhstan. 
feels that everything here, uh, everything there belongs uh, to him. Um, and uh, so I'll quote. I'm inscribed into Kazakhstan. Everything here is mine. I understand everything here. I simply belong here and don't belong at the same time. Recently, people often started taking me for a foreigner in Astana. This ambiguous sense of simultaneously belonging and not belonging can be understood through the consideration of his mode of interaction with the city. Thus, the poems very frequently show the poet walking through the city. He is a passerby and a detached observer. So here's one. I walk through the city. It is February, April. Pigeons peck out the eyes of the asphalt. I walk through the city. My minstrel is behind me. He whispers songs. I listen and remember. <coughs> so poetry is born, born from the whisper of a mysterious minstrel, from the rhythm of the footsteps, from the impressions of things observed and met along the way. Later in the poem, the sense of alienation, separation, and confrontation uh, becomes more uh, pronounced and uh, an effect of this long stroll through the city. I looked ahead, a strand of hair fell on the eyes. I realized that my office mate is a fool, my boss a churl, that everything who walks by is xenophobe. I smoke through the hair on my face, I'm chilled. On the embankment, I hear hipster youth squeak break pop. Um, so, uh, in this rhythm of his walking, there is um, um, a search for identity. And one aspect of the search for identity I want to specific, spe specifically to highlight. This is his search for linguistic identity. Astana has a Babylonian dimension. In this cosmopolitan city of international commerce and diplomacy, where all signs appear in three languages, local residents have their own personal struggles with linguistic identity. The trilingual policy, this estate program announced in the 2007 uh, presidential address called New Kazakhstan in a New World, remains a utopian project. In reality, often not fully fluent in any of the three languages they speak, Kazakhstanis resort to um, mixing these languages to produce meaning that they desire. For ethnic Kazakhs, mixing Russian into their Kazakh speech, a, a colonial heritage, bears a strong cultural stigma. Uh, it's called Shala Kazakh and means a lesser morally compromised Kazakh. However, mixing Kazakh and English words into Russian speech is not similarly stigmatized. A daily phenomenon in contemporary Kazakhstan, a nightmare for language purists, the Russian Kazakh English speech of Kazakhstani youth is still waiting to be studied as both a linguistic phenomenon and an identity influencing one. Anwar Disinbina's poetry uses all three languages. He, don't, he does not mix them, but uh, rather he bumps them against each other. And in this process, he discovers their new rhythmic, semantic, and philosophical potential. Asked why he uses Kazakh in his mostly Russian language poems, Disinbina responds, quote, I do it because it is impossible not to. I wouldn't call this a conscious experiment, but rather an inability to express meaning differently and not uh, to deceive oneself and one's speech at the moment of writing. I grew up in a traditional family, and already at that time, the younger generation spoke Russian while you could only speak Kazakh to the, your grandmother and grandfather. In the poem uh, Metamorph, Dusinbinov contemplates identity problems brought about by this bilingualism. It appears that the Russophone part of the personality brings forward a cosmopolitan mentality, while the Kazakh language part is associated with tradition, tastes, and sensations of childhood and family. The poem starts with posing uh, a problem of whether Russian language is adequate for expressing his Kazakh identity. Uh, it is very strange to worry about Kazakh Paruski, to get nostalgic for Kumis after Lambrusco, to cast glances at the skinny in the narrow circle of preferences, to put Duken the shop to the left of the name instead of Dukeni and to the right. So for making sense of his Kazakh heritage, 
certain Kazakh words I turned um, to not just for being more precise and necessitated by grammar rules, they appear as almost physiological, a physiological phenomenon, as an aftertaste, a residue on the palate. Forgive my questionable bilingua, but so's the word sometimes bursts forth from the limbo and immediately hides back because of the lack of education. Sits on the palate as residue. Touch it with the tip of the tongue. Sweet childhood memories come. Thick and soft fur that you ruffle as you listen about the prophet. And there is something crucial about a je, grandma, to whom it was worth to sit close to as she took glass, glasses from the chest and put them on. So sensations of smell, touch, and closeness to loved ones, religious feeling, childhood fears, come back with a certain taste that words and sounds have for the past. So um, for the seemingly alienated poet, a passerby, the big state appears to be yet another sight to observe, a part of the background like ubiquitous billboards showcasing national propaganda campaign. These appear alongside xenophobic onlookers, pigeons, currency exchange signs as part of monotonous background. So, I walk through the city, the billboards, the exchange rate for a dollar is 150, for the state it's 2050. I walk through the city, the times is 1750. So at the same time, even in his poems, these posters are more, more than just um, background. The billboard referred to in this poem references the national program and the idea of Mangelikiel, the eternal state. The program called Kazakhstan's Way 2050, Common Goal, Common Interests, and Common Future, outlines the president's vision of the country's prosperous future, economic and social development, and proposes a program of investment into that future. Dusinbina's play with numbers monotonous as they seem present the Mangelikiel idea ironically. With the falling dollar, the expiring day, and the atmosphere of sadness, disappointment, economic insecurity, alienation, the utopian vision of prosperity and social cultural inclusion appear um, as what they are, a utopia. So the poet's pos position vis-a-vis -vis the state, however, more than that of, uh, is more than that of an alienated and ironic passive onlooker. I doubt that Dusinbina fully realizes the degree of the civic engagement and political consequences of his poetry. As Astana's most powerful and original poetic voice, Dusinbina produces, produces meanings that become inseparable from the symbolic capital of Astana in Kazakhstan. Equal to Nazarbayev's Mengelik Yel is Dusinbinov's rhyming Mengelik Gel, the eternal wind, the expression of the creative spirit of Astana, not utopian, but real. Uh, in this poem, Dusinbinov confronts and challenges outdated cultural stereotypes and prejudices, which Nazarbayev's Mengelik Yel glosses over and dismisses without overcoming. So I'll read a bit from that poetry. That poem. A couple of months ago, I was called the shame of the great Kazakh nation. Just like that, after looking at my hair, luxurious hair, by the way, and possibly I was putting on acts, airs, and graces, and was happy, talking to someone on the phone, uttering, Andre, I love you too, hard to remember everything now. It is not that I was insult insulted, rather on the contrary, I suddenly thought, or how I would want to be the shame of the great Kazakh nation, how I would want to feel my own insignificance and infamy, or how I would want this splendor to become a dispersed Vespertine light so that I would exist as an inglorious particle of the great and free society, where not even to utter this phrase, they would not even be able to produce it in thoughts, would not be able to do it physically, would not be capable of doing it, that they would have system failure from just a hint of such a thought. And then he goes uh, almost prophetic. And um, um, says the following. So. <laughs> I address you, my poor, exhausted, mixed up Kazakh. You, my crippled one, who pumps his complexes out of the earth. Oh, hello, I say to you. Almost with mania, I would say. I greet you and love you, or let us all try, put together our efforts, aspirations, and dreams. I'm sure we can succeed together. Should we go three, dva, bir, 
I do not know of another idea that would be better to realize than the idea of making me the shame of the great Cossack nation. So I'll just make some conclusions. Um, so in being alienated, in being uh, seemingly detached from the city and uh, sort of expressing what the wind the, and the step tell him, uh, Dusinbinov at the same time articulates something real. The concerns of the present, the concerns of the young people who live um, and create and do business and work in Astana. And in this sense, uh, some of these poems are more political um, than um, some, uh, some of Nazarbayev's speeches because they address something real. Um, somewhere, uh, Dusinbina said that he was attracted to Astana um, and he felt that Astana was the site of migration of two categories of people, students and bureaucrats. <laughs> Uh, so, and uh, coming back to that uh, poster, uh, the, uh, the slide that I started with, so the bureaucrats on top and the students on the bottom, um, I feel that Dusinbinov expresses uh, something um, that's perhaps more promising or more consequential. He expresses this, uh, the spirit of those students and in whom I truly believe, you know, after working at Nazarbayev University. So, thank you very much.